Chapter 14. I hesitated in the doorway of the infirmary. Everything about this room sickened me. The smell, the spotless cabinets, and, most of all, the medical equipment. Just seeing the crash cart and my peripheral vision made my stomach flop like a hooked cod. Still, I forced myself inside. Doc, are you here? I called out. I tacked toward his office at the back, where the door stood open, passing stacks of boxes along the way. I couldn't believe the wealth was recalling him. What if one of the settlers got seriously hurt? As much as I loathed the smells and sounds of the infirmary, if a shark tore up my leg, I'd still rather have Doc stick it up than Raj or some other unqualified settler. Doc wasn't in his office, which looked almost entirely packed up. As I turned to leave, I knocked into an open box and set it toppling. I bent to pick up the scattered files, only to freeze when I recognized the title. Dark Gifts, a Subsea Phenomenon, by Dr. William Metzger, was the stupid article that Gemma kept asking about. I scanned the page, picking out, Conducted brain scans on adolescents who have sub recited subsea for extended periods of time. The results reveal that they have more areas of active brain use. In theory, the intense water pressure stimulates the brain's development and results in abnormal abilities. Many of these adolescents display traits associated with marine life. I got to my feet, still clutching the page, when Doc strode into the office. He didn't seem at all annoyed to see me standing amid his scattered files. Looking for me? he asked. I need a band-aid. A bandage. I managed to croak. When he looked me over, I added, not for me. No one's hurt. I just need it. Okay, he said and pulled open a drawer. I relaxed. He wasn't going to make me explain. Why do you have this? I asked, holding up the paper. He tossed me the rolled bandage. When I took this job, I downloaded every article I could find on the territory so I'd know what I was getting into. Do you believe everything you read? He grimaced. I've been a government employee too long for that. I know better. The wealth has a whole department devoted to pushing its agenda on the public. He rubbed his scared palm, or discrediting anyone who's viewed as a threat. Like the scientists who say the oceans have stopped rising. Exactly. If the Commonwealth isn't in the midst of a crisis, there's no reason to operate under emergency law. The state representatives aren't about to give up that kind of power. I placed the article back in the box and bent to retrieve the rest. As Doc knelt to help me, he asked, Does that article bother you? With a shrug, I turned to the door. Thanks for the bandage. I entered a blood, a sample of the blood we found in the derelict sub into the main computer, Doc said. Curious, I faced him again. If the man's DNA is in the government's data ba bank, Doc went on, I'll know his name by tonight. So it was human blood? Yes, Doc said grimly, and whoever bled out in that sub won't be stopping by to collect his gear. No one could lose that much and live. I winced. Why would the sea blight gang murder the prospector? What could he have owned that they wanted so badly? Thanks for the bandage, I said, turning to go. Doc touched my shoulder. I need to talk to you about your friend Gemma. Feeling more than a little uncomfortable, I watched him cross to his desk. This was sent to me this morning. He rolled back his chair so I could see what was on the screen. A photo of Gemma and a high neck captain, probably taken from an ID card. It went to all the staff at the trade station. It's a missing child post, filed by a boarding home. He studied me. It says that she stole money from the director's office. My heart sank like an anchor. Are you going to report her? He considered it. No, he said finally, but someone else might. Then Gemma and I don't have much time. Doc raised a brow. For what? Thanks, I said and sprinted for the door. It's my money. Richard sent it to me and Miss Spinner took it, Gemma fumed. She said she'd give it back when I wasn't her responsibility. But how is that going to happen unless Richard signs my emancipation form? I needed the money to get here. How did you get here? like I want another lecture. She plucked the bandage from my fingers and ducked back into the loss and found, leaving me to wait nervously in the corridor. When she finally stepped out of the forge room, I said, the hall is empty, let's go. So I pass? Yeah. If you look closely, you'd still be able to tell she was a girl, but I didn't think the denizens of the saloon never looked at anyone too closely. Some low life might take offense. I checked around the corner and beckoned her over my shoulder. If we're going into the saloon, it's got to be now, while no one else is here. Who's going to stop us? She scoffed. Actually, I called up another reinforcement of patience. If a settler sees me, he'll not only stop me from going into the saloon, he'll drag me home by the scuff of my dive skin. Why? She seemed genuinely perplexed. These people are my neighbors. Down here, that means something. The saloon is the one place in Belthmick ter territory where hopefully no one will recognize me. But who knows, maybe our librarian is down there kicking back the booze. That's the nicest thing I've ever heard, she said softly. That our librarian drinks? She gave a choked laugh. That everybody looks out for you. 
yeah, it's nice until I do something I shouldn't. My parents hear about it from six sources. By the way, sneaking into the saloon falls into that category, so if you've changed your haven't, she gave me the once over. But if people are looking out for you, you should put on new clothes too. When the elevator doors opened on sub-level three, a tsunami of noise swept over us. I was dressed as a tidal mill rouse about in a blue jumpsuit and knit hat, which I pulled down to my eyes. I wasn't worried so much about the customers recognized me, but in the 10 years since the trade station was built, I'd met most of the staff. We stepped onto a catwalk four stories above the saloon floor. Jenna gasped. Why are we up here? This is the hive. You wanted to bunk here, remember? I pointed to either side of the center shaft, where three levels of windowed hatches lined the walls, resembling a giant honeycomb. Still, Gemma hung back. If you want to get to the saloon, we have to take these stair ladders down. Although it had been years since I'd been on this level, I knew the layout because I had free run of the place where my father supervised the trade station's construction. Back then, the recreation deck had left had felt serene with its four-story wall of windows and underwater view. The view remained, but the shouting and clanking tankards demolished all sense of serenity. I crossed the top catwalk to peer over the railing at the saloon far below. It was like looking down on an eel garden, except that every so often a burst of flame would erupt. Seaweed cigars needed continual relighting, so the tables had built-in burners. At the bar, men pushed against one another unsteadily. Still, I'd rub shoulders with gamblers and wild catters over a wealthy topsider any day. I glanced at Gemma, who was unusually pale. Having second thoughts? I asked. She glo glowered at me like a hermit crab defending its shell. Come on, you'll feel right at home, I teased. With all the people and noise, it could be the mainland. She baked deeper into the elevator alcove. What's wrong? Grimacing, she pointed at the catwalk. The steel mesh was so fine that even though there were two more catwalks beneath it, I could still see the saloon floor. With its suspension wires and thin railings, the whole structure did seem like temporarily scaffolding. You'd be the lightest person to ever walk on it. I stamped my foot. Sure, the catwalk trembled, but that was a good thing. Every part of this trade station was designed to give a little, or sometimes a lot. The surface deck would automatically disengage from the lower station if any of the lower levels sprang a leak. Somehow, I didn't think Gemma would find comfort in that fact. Look, it's perfectly safe, I said, throwing my weight from side to side so that all of the levels swayed. Again, that was a good thing in subsea architecture, but Gemma remained backed against the elevator doors. I thought you were desperate to find your brother. She started coming forward again. Shoot, I muttered. I had just blown my chance to get her out of here, all because I wanted her to see my father's design was safe. I bounced on the balls of my feet, making the catwalk jump. Actually, this does feel flimsy. Walk away, she snapped. Now! I shrugged, leaning against a suspension wire. I watched her leave the alcove and pick her way along the row of sleeping capsules. Footsteps clanged beneath us and a voice bellowed, Get away from my berth! Spreading my feet, I looked down to see two men on the catwalk below. I recognized Lefty Halfway, the preparator of the hive. It's not your berth no more, Lefty growled at the man facing him. Other than collecting the nightly fee, Lefty didn't have much to do except keep the berths clean. The hive was the ultimate efficiency hotel in which the rooms weren't much bigger than coffins. Prospectors rented them by the night, while mining companies contracted for, for whole rows and the miners lived in the cramped capsules all year long. Below, the fight about the prospectors' non-payment escalated. Gemma's breathing quickened as she peered down at the two men who were now throwing punches. Their efforts had all three cat catwalks jumping. She swallowed hard like she was about to puke. They're just eels. They don't scare you, remember? I reminded her. Those aren't eels, she said. Those are psychos. Then Lefty whipped out a jagged blade. The prospector pounded up the stair ladder. Psychos with big knives, Gemma amended. They're going to make this stupid thing fall down. Probably, I agreed cheerfully. Can we leave now? No. She pulled her hood down to her eyes. I didn't come subsea to get scared away by a couple of... She screamed as the prospector flew past us, thrown by Lefty, who was now at the top of the stairs. She caught my look of warning. Boys scream, she whispered defensively. So do men. If we stick around, I'm sure we'll hear one. Scaring me isn't going to work. She headed for the stair ladder. Lefty blocked her way, squinting with suspicion. You're too young to be on this level. Our ma sent us, she said in a husky voice. We're supposed to find our pa and bring him home. To my surprise, Lefty nodded. Okay. He let her pass. Just be quick. Pulling my cap low, I followed Gemma down the stair ladder to the middle catwalk. Good act, I admitted grudgingly. You sound like a real pioneer. She grinned. I was doing you. Me? Some people have poker faces, but you have a poker voice. Guarded and a little hoarse. I nailed it. The clang of boots on the second stair ladder ended her boasting. I beckoned her away from the top of the ladder. You can't go down if someone's coming up. There isn't room. I didn't sound guarded or hoarse. She peeked over the railing and inhaled sharply. It's your friend Jibby. Is he alone? There's a man behind him. Big guy. Bushy black beard. That had to be Raj. 
whose mouth was even bigger than his ego. They'd see through my disguise in a click. Whirling, I pried open an empty capsule and motioned to Gemma, who gamely climbed inside. I wriggled in after her and closed the hatch. At five, I'd love the cozy berths complete with shelves, a fold-down desk, and a computer screen, all built into the walls. But the capsules were designed to hold one person, and seemed much smaller now that I wasn't five. As we lay on our stomachs, it was a very snug fit. Through the tinted windows in the hatch, I saw Jibby climb onto the catwalk. Ranger Grimes is going to turn the derelict sub over to the sea guard, he said, passing right by our berth. Sure enough, Roger Dirani clambered up next, bigger and louder than life. Grimes doesn't give a barnacle's knee if a prospector gets killed. He won't go after the scum that did it. With one boot on the stair ladder, Jibby paused to listen to him. I'd made the right choice by hiding. Raj took parental duty very seriously, probably because he was raising his 12-year-old daughter alone. He would have hauled me back to Mom and Pa without breaking stride. Inside the berth, Gemma sat, on her, sat back on her knees. The top of her hair had cleared the ceiling by inches. Glacial, she whispered. I wish I had this much space of my own. She leaned across me and pried open a door to the capsule wall, then oohed with delight over the mini fridge. Shh, these aren't sound. I choked on my own words when Raj smacked a hand at the hatch window and leaned against it. The sea blight gang got sunk the Peavy's house, Raj went on. It's a fact. We let it go by, and those outlaws will think they can help themselves to anything that's ours. Crops, livestock. I can't get a woman to come to a subsea on account of them. Ever think it might be on account of your smell? I heard Jibby ask. Raj snorted and headed for the last stair ladder. Once their boots were out of sight, I flipped onto my back to find Gemma leaning over me. She pressed a hand to my chest for balance as she switched on the screen above the hatch. Ooh, it's a phone, too. She sat back, smiling. We have everything we need in here. We could hide out for days and see who goes by. Hey, you're glowing again. She considered me a moment. I think you glow more when you're embarrassed. Maybe that's how you blush. I'm not embarrassed. Now I sounded hoarse. Total poker voice. I pushed open the hatch and climbed out. Spending days inside our berth with her would be unsettling to think about given our precarious situation. I needed to focus. Looking up through the steel mesh catwalk, I watched Jibby and Raj disappear into the elevator. And I don't glow. Please, she scoffed, climbing out of the berth. Fireflies have nothing on you. Rather than ask what a firefly was, I said, before we hit the saloon, we need a plan. Like what? Like don't go up to anyone? Just look for your brother in the crowd? But don't make eye contact. Aye, aye, Captain. I followed her down the next two stair ladders, whispering more instructions as they came to me. And don't flash his photo around. You don't know if he's on someone's bad side. Got it, she said over her shoulder as she aligned onto the saloon floor. Staggering drunks surrounded us, but that didn't faze Gemma. She got her way through the mob, easy as you please, leaving me to trail in her wake. At least she was following the plan, I thought, until she slapped a thin, slim, blonde man on the shoulder. When he turned, she thrust her brother's picture at him. Maybe if she'd waited to get a good look at the guy's ice blue eyes, she wouldn't have been so quick to demand. Have you seen him? At most, the guy had three years on us. More likely, he had two and a fake ID. Yet, there was nothing young about his hard expression. His hair was dead straight, almost white, and so long that it touched his ribs. He glanced at the photo. For a split second, I saw surprise flash across his face. But when he lifted his gaze, I wondered if I was wrong. Friendly as a barracuda, he stared at Gemma, studying her. I realized with a start, taking in every detail of her face. I plucked the photo from her fingers. Either you've seen him or not, I said, stepping in. Not, he replied coldly, then slipped away through the crowd. Will you please stop drawing attention to yourself? I whispered angrily. For some reason, that had Gemma snorting with laughter. I clapped my hand over her mouth with striking speed as men turned on their stools to look at her. Okay, here's the deal, I said in my bossiest big brother voice. You don't talk while we're in here because even when you're doing, even when you're doing me, you sound like a girl. Same as when you laugh. And don't poke any more strangers. She shoved my hand away. I mean it, or I'll drag you straight to the ranger and tell him you're a runaway and wanted for stealing. Now her eyes were light with fury. Are we clear? She said nothing, just steamed. Gemma, you told me not to talk, she hissed. What are you boys doing in here? A voice behind us demanded. I spun in time to see the bartender slam a, a counter open and storm over to us. The man was old and missing an eye. I'm not losing my license over a pair of duffies like you. Before I could reply, a second bartender leaned over the counter. Leave him alone, Otto. The pitch of the voice told me that a woman was addressing us. Still, it was hard to reconcile that with the narrow-eyed, shaved-beard bartender in front of us. Boys, you better check out of here if you know what's good for you, she said. Gemma snatched Richard's photo from my hand. We don't mean to cause you trouble, mister, she said, doing another lousy imitation of me, but even gruffier this time. She offered the photo to the bartender named Otto. We're just here to look for my brother. He doesn't know that our ma is sick. Have you seen him? 
The man's expression softened. Now you feel like crap, don't you, Otto? The female bartender taunted. Next time, ask a few questions before worrying about your license. Shut up, Mel. The old man took the photo from Gemma and squinted his one eye at it. Nope, I don't believe I've seen him. He passed the photo to Mel. She shook her head, too. Not that I remember every ugly mug that comes down here, she added, hand handing the photo back to me. But I tried to keep an eye open on for the young ones. You never know what will happen in this cesspool. Why don't you leave the picture with us, Otto suggested. We'll show it to these thugs when they buy drinks. It's not safe for you boys to stick around here. I was in total agreement, but before I could convince Gemma of anything, I noticed the icy blonde guy in the back corner, whispering into the ear of a huge, dark-skinned man. Let's get out of here. I pressed a hand into Gemma's back. No, but it was too late. The big man's eyes were on us. We just got here, she whispered, not budging under the pressure of my hand. We'll pretend to leave and then mix in with the crowd. I couldn't peel my eyes off the Latvian le seated on the other side of the saloon. He had his back to the glass wall, which had to be on purpose. His skin was so dark he practically disappeared against the murky blue sea outside. He wore pants and a shark skin vest, but no shirt. Showing off his chest, which was roped with muscle, his face was unreadable, as if it had been carved from granite. His features were broad and heavy. His head, clean-shaven, and his recognition hit me like a crowbar to the gut. I knew the shape of that skull, the slash of that mouth. So what if the man's skin was now brown, not stark white? There was no doubt in my mind, none at all. It was shade.